I'm turning now on the Word of God to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, and reading verses 3 and 4. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, and reading verses 3 and 4. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And my subject this evening is Christ's Pattern for Churches. And here we see... uh, principle and a priority and a pattern for the churches of Jesus Christ throughout all ages, but not just for churches, but also vital priorities for the Christian life. Uh, And we begin our study in the very first verse of chapter 6. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Well, many, many people, through the uh, preaching of the gospel, through the ministry of the apostles, many were coming to Christ. The numbers were gathering apace. So many, it was such a wonderful, abundant revival in the early church. But, inevitably, with the vast numbers of people coming to saving faith in Christ, difficulties would arise. There would be, even as believers, there would be contentions with the old nature. There would be Satan, no doubt, striving to cause divisions. Uh, He was active as well. And here we have in verse 1 a complaint by the Grecians, that is the Greek-speaking Jews. The Jews who were from other nations, they were Jewish, but they they were brought up in other nations, and they are now residing in Jerusalem. They had a a complaint against the Hebrews, that is the native Jews, those who were born and bred in, uh, in Israel, Jerusalem particularly, and the complaint was that their widows, the widows, uh, the Greek-speaking widows, were being neglected with the daily administration, the, the um, daily provision of needs of the people, uh, those who were in great need, who were in poverty, uh, the distribution of of food and so on, well, their widows were being neglected. That was the complaint. It was very unlikely that it was deliberate, uh, and the apostles certainly weren't aware of it and weren't involved in it. They were so busy with their ministry and the preaching of the word and spreading the word, they would have not known about this. The duty of the distribution was probably uh, uh, unofficially uh, distributed by native, the native uh, Jews, and, well, they should have been more thoughtful. They should have been more thoughtful of everyone. So uh, the complaint was probably legitimate. I don't think it caused a lot of uh, friction and division, but the apostles quickly want to uh, deal with this matter, but they're inspired by the Lord and how they approach it in verses 2 and 3. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye, among, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So the apostles quickly convene and organize a meeting in the, for the church, and many believers are there and gathered and they explain to the church that their involvement in these matters, in these practical matters, if they were to be directly involved in these matters, this would, would frustrate their calling. They were called to preach the gospel. They were called to um, uh, uh, um, explain the doctrines and teach and preach. Uh, that's what, that was their calling and prayer, of course. And if they were to be involved in these practical matters, matters that would frustrate the work of God. Therefore, by necessity and inspired by the Spirit, they asked the church to look for men, capable men, men with these qualifications, which we see in verse 
in verse 3 with these qualifications. Look, look among you and these men are called and chosen for, uh, to assist in these matters. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So they asked the church, and they themselves must have been well aware of these men as well, and the qualities, honest report, honest report in their secular work and at home, being men of integrity and honesty. Uh, you couldn't imagine, imagine, for example, if they weren't, if they were known to cause trouble or, or they were they were known to be dishonest or uh, in their secular work. What a reproach that would have been on the church. So of necessity, they would have had to have been men of great integrity without uh, blameless concerning their witness in the world. That was absolutely essential. They would have had to have been men full of the Holy Spirit. That is the marks of grace so obvious, bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. They were so patient. They were so gentle. They were so loving. And they were so zealous. All the gift all the fruit was there the gifts were there that had that was assen- that was essential because they would be dealing with people all the time so they would have to be very long suffering and gentle and, under- and understanding so that was essential they would have to have had wisdom and spiritual discernment so that they could approach some of these matters some of the matters may have been complex but they approach these things according to what the word teaches so all these qualifications <clears throat> were essential. Now that although we're not given, although the title is not given here in this passage, that they were called deacons. These that this is what they were called to do. They were called these. This is the first instant in the New Testament of deacons being called to assist in the church. In the church, even though that term is not used, actually, if you look at the first verse and the last word in the first verse, ministration. The Greek is where we get our word deacon from, uh, and it's translated deacon um, in the pastoral epistles. Uh, the Apostle Paul, later on, would crystallize the roles and the qualifications of deacons and pastors uh, and elders, not just pastors, elders, teaching elders, ruling elders, and so on, uh, and deacons. He would crystallize the roles and the qualifications in his pastoral letters. Uh, a good example of this and a primary example is First Timothy chapter 3. But here is the first instance of deacons being called uh, to help with these, practical, with these practical matters. And then we read on in verse 4, uh, this vital principle and pattern which Christ has ordained for churches throughout, throughout the history of the world. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of of the word, we must devote ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. This is our calling. This is what the Lord has called us to. And this is vital for the Christian ministry. This is vital for the call of men to the ministry. Yes, time is also given for visitations and for counsel and other practical matters. But our priority as those who are called to the ministry, to the Christian ministry, is the word and prayer. This is, vi- this is vital. It's a timeless pattern for churches, churches for all ages. And this, this does need to be emphasized today. It needs to be emphasized and it needs to be taught often because we live in a day of innovations. We live in a day of new ideas cropping up all the time. Uh, and they often use terminology as, as follows. Um, we need to uh, do church this way. Uh, 40 days purpose-driven strategy which will radically transform your church um, everything else that you did in the past is irrelevant now we, we don't need we, we can ignore that we can ignore the bible's blueprint and we can do it our way that's the, the arrogance and pride of of people who say they write they write these books and they say this is this is how you should run do your church no we we we, we have it right here this principle this pattern it's by the word and prayer that the blessing of God come, that the blessing of God comes down, and we must um, warn about these things because this idea, these innovations and ideas today are so prevalent. Even the word sermon is becoming offensive today. The very word sermon, and now it's being called short talks, 
And, this, and it's not even a sermon sometimes. The, the, the message is reduced to like 15 or 10 minutes. And it's now, and it's, if, it, if it's not a sermon, it's a discussion. The rest of the service is dominated by entertainment. You can call it worship if you want, but it's, an, it's, it's entertainment. But according to, these verse, according to these verses, according to this verse and other verses in, this, in the Bible, the work and the life of the church is dominated by the word and prayer. And this is why uh, faithful churches have uh, mid, a midweek meeting, meeting or midweek meetings for prayer and for Bible study. It's, it's the preeminent. It's the pattern. It's Christ's pattern for his church. It's by the word and prayer that we are built up in our faith, that we are conformed to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's by the word and prayer that souls are converted to Christ and they in turn are made disciples and grow in grace. Yes, there are the other means of grace as well, worship and, and fellowship and so on, but this is so vital. This is the pattern which Christ has laid down for his churches, the word and prayer. There is no room... And it's so sad to see this today, but there is no room for innovations and for clever gimmicks and uh, to make the faith more palatable for uh, the fallen human nature. No, we must discard these things. And it, it's, it is tragic that so many churches are capitulating to new, all these new ideas uh, and all these new things uh, to... Uh, Draw in the people. They, they may not be aware of it, but, they, but they're dishonoring Christ. They dishonor Christ because this is Christ's pattern. It's not made up by men. It's not old-fashioned. It's not, old, it's not outdated. It's Christ's pattern for, ble- for blessing. And so by trusting in the modern chariots of entertainment and so on, they're dishonoring Christ by neglecting the word and, pr- and prayer. So that, that these things do need to be uh, voiced and emphasized, especially today. Well, we, I, I explain these things because it's here in, in, these, in these verses. But we move on to verses 5 and 6. Uh, the congregation, the believers gathered, are, um, concur, and they're pleased with what the apostles uh, tell them. Of course, they're inspired by the Lord. And, saying, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of, Anti- of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on, on them. So men fit for office were quickly identified, and they stood out, and the apostles no doubt knew who they were as well, and special attention is given to Stephen in the narrative. Uh, at, the, at the very outset, uh, the Holy Spirit draws special attention to Stephen. And the reason for this is, be- is what happens after this. He will be arrested. He will give us a f- his defense before the Sanhedrin Council. And then he will be martyred. He will have the privilege and the honor of being the first martyr in the, in the church of Jesus Christ. So no wonder why there is special attention given to Stephen here. It doesn't mean that he was head and shoulders above the rest. It doesn't mean that. Don't be mistaken. We assume that all these men were very zealous and gifted men and by the Spirit of God. And we know, we, we, we know this to be the case. Uh, for example, if we look at Philip, Philip is mentioned as well. And we know that the Lord mightily used him later on in uh, reaching many souls for Christ. Uh, and remember, he, con- he through his labors by the Spirit of God, he con- converted that um, Ethiopian eunuch. So the Lord mightily used him as well. So all these men were really faithful men who loved the Lord and were willing to lay down their lives for the Lord. But special attention is given to Stephen because of what would happen to him. The narrative follows the events of Stephen's, well, his arrest, his defense, and then his, his, mar- his martyrdom. But the question I want to ask is, where did these men come from? How did this spiritual maturity come about? Well, when they were converted, if they were converted through the apostles' ministry, or if they were Christians before that, but when they were converted, they no doubt followed the doctrine of the apostles, and they continued in prayer. And it's by these means that these men were built up in their faith, 
and they were uh, reached that caliber where they were dedicated servants of Christ and they were willing to serve the Lord, come what may. And this this caliber of men filled with the Holy Spirit could not have arisen by any other means than the word and prayer. And this is why this pattern is so exceedingly important. If they adopted what we see so so much of today, if the, if, the New, if the New Testament church in those times had a very casual approach to worship and it was all just fun and games, then such men would not have existed. All you would have is just hay, wood and stubble. So it, it, it cannot be emphasized enough how important this principle and pattern is for churches of all times. But then the apostles... Um, uh, having these men brought before them and they ordaining them for this great call, they lay their hands upon these upon these men. They pray for them and they lay their hands upon them. Uh, nothing. There wasn't any power or special abilities imparted to them through the laying on of hands, but it was rather a ceremonial act. It was very precious. It was very wonderful. They, the apostles were given the authority by God um, to do this. And by the endorsement of the apostles ordaining them for this ministry, it was God's endorsement. And it was a beautiful ceremonial act of laying their hands, God calling them to this great work by the authority of the apostles, by the authority of God himself. And look at the result of this in verse in verse 7. And the word of God increased... And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. That's very exciting, actually. Verse 7. I wonder whether, I can't help but go back, I can't go, help but go back in my mind's eye to the temple, to the outer court, and there they are, are the apostles, perhaps. Perhaps they were, they were no doubt preaching in other places as well. But you go back and you see this a couple of times beforehand in the book of Acts, where they're pre- preaching at Solomon's porch, that vast area in the outer court, and there's many thousands of people listening, and you can imagine that were, there were priests there. And to begin with, they may have had ske- skeptical expressions on their faces. There were many, many priests, in fact. Um, and as they heard the apostles preach and quote scriptures, maybe Isaiah um, speaking about the Messiah and the expression of the priest's faces started to change and they, you saw skepticism turn to concern as they realized we have crucified our own Messiah and many, we're told, were obedient to the faith. Faith. There were many who, who weren't obedient to the faith but there were also many who were. Many were converted through the instrumentality of the apostles by the power of the Holy Spirit as the apostles Explain to them that the Christ of the Scriptures was Jesus Himself, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the Messiah, in the read about in the Scriptures. And now, through the instrumental, we come to the uh, part of the chapter where special attention and focus is given to the ministry and the trials of Stephen, uh, verses eight to ten. And Stephen, full of faith, one of the men elected to the office. Uh, deacon, even though the term was not used yet in the chapter. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and the Cyrenians and Alexandrians of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Stephen was with the other with the other six. Stephen was a close companion of the apostles, and he was also given gifts of healing and doing wonderful signs and wonders. No doubt he was preaching as well while he was, and God gave him grace and moved by the Spirit to heal people and to perform signs and wonders. But his witness was he had such a his witness had such an influence and it was reaching so many people that, of course, hostility arose. I, only, I just mentioned recently in our Bible study that whenever there is a work of God, there will be Satan 
um, Satan will be aroused. He will be infuriated in some shape or form. And here we see it again. So many examples in the scriptures. When there is a true work of God, Satan is aroused to attack. And we see it here with, with Stephen. And it came in the form of these foreign Jews. The Libertines and the Alexandrians and so on. They had their own synagogue. They were now residing and they were permanent occupants in Jerusalem and they had their own synagogue. Uh, the Libertines, uh, Alexandrians from Egypt. Uh, Libertines probably, according to a, a lot of the commentators and theologians, probably they were probably Roman prisoners um, taken from the Syrian wars, uh, the Jews in that area, and at some point they were set free and many of them returned to Jeru- Jerusalem. They were evidently very zealous for the Mosaic law and for the ceremonial worship. They were dedicated and committed to this. They had a, they had their own righteousness, but in the words of the Apostle Paul, not according to knowledge, in Romans chapter 10. And they were contending with Stephen. They heard him preaching. They saw the demonstrations of the power of God, and they were jealous, and they were furious, and they saw the influence he had, and so they contended with him. But the truth which Stephen spoke, and it was the truth, he spoke it with such conviction, and it was so convincing that they were speechless. They couldn't answer back. They couldn't resist the truth which Stephen spoke, which made them all the more infuriated. He was probably, again, pointing them to the scriptures, their own scriptures, testifying to them that this is the Christ, this is the Christ. And there's a lesson for us here, friends, and it's this, the importance in an age, in an age even in churches where there is a lot of biblical illiteracy, but how important it is for us to uh, endeavor to be so thoroughly understanding of our faith, knowing the doctrines, being familiar with the doctrines, and knowing the scriptures, and understanding the principles, um, knowing these things, and, and endeavoring to know and to know more, so that when opportunities arise, we may be ready, or when we're challenged, we may be ready. I just turn your attention to that well-known passage of Scripture concerning this very point. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that it is, that is within you, with meekness and fear. That was certainly the case with Stephen. And we pray that the Lord would help us in that respect also, to ever be learning and growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we move on to verses 11 and 12. Then, that is these foreign Jews, now in their own synagogue in Jerusalem, then they suborned men. Interesting term, I'll explain that in a moment. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him, and brought him to the council. They resorted to deception. They couldn't, they could, they, they, they couldn't um, defend their position. Uh, Stephen spoke the truth with such clarity, and with the blessing of God, that they couldn't resist, so they resorted to deception. They, uh, to, try, to try to get him into trouble, to get him arrested. And this is what is meant here by the phrase, they suborned men. What is meant by that is that they they secretly bribed men, flattered them, convinced them that what Stephen was saying was wrong and they, and they must have bribed them. And these men who were bribed and who were de- may have been deceived by uh, these um, Jews, well, they, started, they, they accused Stephen. They were twisting the truth. They were lying. They were telling half-truths and they were twisting what Stephen was saying to the crowd. And these accusations against Stephen stirred the crowd into a wild frenzy of rage. And so much so that the scribes also were aroused and infuriated and arrested him immediately and brought him before the Sanhedrin council. Well, friends, there's nothing new under the sun. This has been one of Satan's strategies right from the beginning to take the truth and distort it. Hath God said? Well, he takes a part of the truth and he throws in a lie. 
It's partly true, but there's a lie there as well. He distorts the truth. This is what they did with Stephen. This is what they did in Christ's trial. When Christ was trialed, men were accusing him and twisting what he said. But we see this happening today. This happens today uh, wholesale. You see this in the media. You see this in, in Hollywood where the Christian faith and the Bible and God's people are characterized uh, caricaturized and, and depicted as uh, the faith is seen as evil it's, uh, and, and backward and Christians are portrayed as narrow-minded and bigoted and, and judgmental. And I don't watch any of these things but I do look at some reviews and sometimes in these movies you, Christians are seen as uh, sexually deviant, axe-wielding maniacs. The, the way Christians are depicted in Hollywood nowadays no wonder why people are so antagonistic to the faith. And we sometimes encounter this in our, in our handing out of tracts in the street. Uh, we, people are welcome to, so often people take the leaflet gladly, but uh, sometimes someone, as soon as they look at it, they're so infuriated and they quickly throw it in the bin. Uh, as soon as they just read one or two lines, Jesus' name is mentioned, and in fury they quickly throw it in the bin. Uh, well, this is deliberate, dishonest brainwashing. It's done by self. They suborned men. This is what Satan did then. It's one of his tactics, tactics throughout the ages, and he does it a lot today, uh, brainwashing people, taking half-truths and distorting it with lies. And, and it's almost, you, you almost think that the Satan is preparing uh, the world for the persecution against Christians. It seems to be a perfect storm brewing, where the minds of the masses... Uh, the, the growing hostility towards the Christian faith, when you look at all the things that people are into and what they're watching and how Christ and God's people in the church are seen as wicked and evil friends. Uh, this is what we see in his, with Stephen and this is what we see today. Done by stealth, they suborned men. But as we've seen already, Christ, Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, is able to shatter this high, uh, satanic spell by the preaching of the, of, the, of the gospel. So we take encouragement and faith in what the Lord can do and that he is on the throne and he is sovereign. But verse 13 and 14, it reaches a climax. And when they, and set up, they set up false witnesses, they suborn, they deceive, they bribe men to do this in secret. They set up false witnesses which said, this man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. He did not say that. Uh, we're given an example in these verses, not only of the half-truths that these men were lying about, these half-truths, these lies, but we're also given... A, a hint of what Stephen was actually saying. Was Stephen really saying derogatory things about the temple and about the laws of God and that Christ was going to destroy all these things? Was Stephen really bad-mouthing Moses and God? Of course not. What nonsense. What Stephen probably said was something along these lines. The worship which God had instituted through Moses is not an end in itself. Think about it, dear friends. This is Stephen, somewhere along these lines. God has instituted this wonderful ceremonial worship through Moses, but my fellow Jews, it's not an end in and of itself. You know by the very nature of this worship, it's ceremonial. It's pointing to the Messiah. It's pointing to Christ. He is the fulfillment of all the sacrifices. He is the one who is pure and holy by the ceremonial washings. We understand that we have to come to God pure, without spot, and the spotless lamb. It's all pointing to him, don't you see? And he has entered into the holy place for us, the holy of holies. He is the one that's entered into heaven for us. Only he could do it. He is the one that obtained salvation for us. He probably said something along those lines. Does that sound derogatory to you? Of course not. It's wonderful. God is not honored, but dishonored by this, but he's glorified because all that he had promised through the law and the prophets has now come to pass through the Messiah. 
And this is what Stephen, some, something along those lines. And I just want to turn you to a wonderful passage in, 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 in the letter to the Hebrews concerning these matters. The book of Hebrews is so wonderful concerning this. The best commentary on the books of Moses is no doubt the book of Hebrews. Go there before you go to any other commentary. Because uh, scripture, of course, scripture comparing scripture, but Hebrews is wonderful. I'll just quote some verses uh, concerning uh, this glorious reality of Christ fulfilling all these things. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, and I'm reading into verse 10 to verse 1. But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more ta- and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, that is heaven. The holy place depicts heaven, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For the law, having a shadow, it's a shadow, it's not the substance, having a shadow of things of good things to come, not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So Stephen was probably speaking about these things, these issues, pointing that these all these things are types and shadows, not the substance. Uh, for, therefore, it was a fulfillment. It wasn't a destroying of what was what happened in the past, but a fulfillment of these things. But we move now to the last verse of the chapter, verse 15. And this verse is very precious. And all that sat in the council, he's now standing before the Sanhedrin council, and all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. What is meant here by the face of an angel? Of course, it's not to be taken literally. Uh, Stephen's face did, didn't start, it didn't begin to glow with a sol- celestial light. That, something like that didn't happen. But it does speak volumes of what happens very often when Christians do face death and are martyred for the faith. God, in his incredible grace and mercy, and we see this in church history, and we see this here with Stephen, God gave Stephen such a peace and such a joy, and he gave him such composure in the face of death. It, it, it's as if he was already in heaven. It, 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 and the Sanhedrin were the total opposite. There they were, agitated, ruffled, infuriated. But he was the complete opposite. His countenance had peace and calmness and composure written all over it. He, he knew, that I'm convinced that he knew that he was going to die. Stephen knew that he was moments away from death and he was probably musing on the glorious reality of seeing his favor, seeing his savior face to face. Moments from now, I will see my blessed savior. And his soul was probably so filled with excitement and the God, as a result of this, gave him such a peace and, and, such, a, and such a joy. And the council were amazed at this. They were looking steadfastly, what is this? What is it? Where is, where, is, where is this coming from? He looks so calm and so composed. And this, this must have agitated them all the more. Where did this, where did Stephen's maturity come from? It's no mystery to us, is it? Of course, he's converted, but he, he loved the Lord and he held on to this important pattern and principle, um, cleaving to the Lord's word in communion with his Savior, this, uh, in the word and prayer. And we will know the same help and grace in time of need and trouble when we prioritize the means of grace above everything else in our life, when we put the Lord first, when we cherish his word, when we cherish communion with him far above anything else as a church corporately and as individual uh, Christians. If this is the case, then we will know the Lord's mighty help and grace Yes, if the Lord does ever call us to martyrdom, we don't know what the future holds. But even in the difficulties and the problems that we face as as Christians and as a church, um, when we cleave to these things and and prioritize this pattern, God will mightily help us and bless us in these things. And may this be the case with us, dear brothers and sisters. Amen.